live from Berlin, Germany. It's the Cube covering NetApp Insight 2017. Brought to you by NetApp. Welcome back to the Cube's live coverage of NetApp Insight. I'm Rebecca Knight, your host, along with my co-host Peter Burris. We are joined by Brett Roscoe. He is the Vice President for Solutions and Service Marketing at NetApp, and Laura Dubois, who is a Group Vice President at IDC. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks thank for having for, us. Yeah, thank you for having us. So, so NetApp and IDC uh, partnered together and worked on this big research project, as you were calling it, a thought leadership project, to really tease out what the companies that are that are thriving and being successful with their data strategies are doing and what separates from those from those that are merely just surviving. Right. Do you want to just lay the scene for our viewers and explain yeah. why, why you embarked on this? Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, NetApp has embarked on its own journey, right? Its own transformation. If you look at where the company's been in the, you know, really over the past few years in terms of becoming a traditional storage company to a truly a software, cloud-focused, um, data-focused company, right? And, and that means a whole different kind of set of capabilities for that we provide to our customers. It's a it's a different. Our customers are looking at data in a different way. So this, so what we did was look at that and say, well, we know that we're going through a transformation. So we know our customers are going through a journey themselves, and how you know whatever their business model is, it's being disrupted by this digital economy, and we wanted a way to kind of work with IDC and and really help our customers to understand what that journey might look like, where they might be on that path, and what are the tools and what are the engagement models for us to help them along that journey, right? So that, that was really the goal, was really, to, it's engagement with our customers, it's looking and being curious about where they are on their journey on digital, and how do they, how do they move forward in that, in, in, you know, in doing all kinds of new things like new customer opportunities and, and, and new business and cost optimization, all that kind of stuff. So that's what really got us interested in the project to begin with. Yeah, and I would just add to that, you know, revenue is at risk of disruption across pretty much every industry. And you know, what's different is the amount of revenue that's at risk within one industry to the next. And all of this revenue that's at risk is really as a consequence of you know, new kinds of business models, new kinds of products and services that are getting launched, new ways of engaging with customers. And these are some of the things that we see, you know, thrivers doing and outperforming, you know, merely just survivors or even just data resistors, you know. And so, you know, we want to understand, I think, you know, the characteristics of data thrivers, right? And what are they doing that's that's uniquely different and what are their attributes versus you know companies that are just surviving. So let's tease that out a little bit. What are these data thrivers doing differently? What are some of the best practices that have emerged from this study? Well, I mean, I think if you look at, there's, you know, the, we, there's a lot of great information that came out of the study for us in terms of what they're doing. I think in a nutshell, it's really, they, they put a focus on their data and they look at it as an asset to their business, right? Which means a lot of different things. And in terms of how is the data able to drive opportunities for them, right? I mean, there's so many companies now that are getting insights from their data and they're able to push that back to their customers. I mean, NetApp is a perfect example of that, right? We actually do that with our customers. All the telemetry data we collect from our own systems, we provide that information back to our customers so they can help plan and optimize their own environments. So I think data is certainly, it's kind of it validated kind of our, our, our theory, our message of where we're going with data, but I think the data focus. I mean, there's lots of other attributes. I mean, there's the addition. There's this. There's a focus of hiring a chief data officers right. within the company. Right. Um, there's certainly lots of other attributes, Laura, that you can comment on. Yeah, as well. I mean, we see new roles emerging around data, right? And so we see the rise of the data management office. Um, we see the the emergence of a chief data officer. We see data architects, uh, certainly data scientists and this data role that's increasingly integrated into sort of the traditional IT organization, enterprise architecture. Um, and so enterprise architecture and these data roles very, very closely aligned um, is one, I would say, example of a sort of a, a best practice in terms of the, the thriver organizations is, is having these data champions, if you will, or, or data visionaries. Um, and, you know, 
certainly there's a lot of things that need to go to be done to have a successful execution around a data strategy as a first place, but then you know a successful execution around data. Um, and, and there's a lot of challenges that, that that exist today around data as well. So the survey, you know, highlighted that, you know, you know, obviously data is distributed, it's dynamic, and it's diverse. It, it's not only in your public, private cloud, but in public cloud. I think they said 34% of, uh, on average, of data is in a public cloud, right? So, um, so you know, how to deal with these challenges is, I think, also one of the things that you guys wanted to sort of yeah. highlight. Yeah, and I think the other the other big revelation was the, the the thrivers, right? One of the aspects, right? So they're data focused, but they're also they're making business decisions with their data, right? They tend to use that data in terms of their operations and how they drive their business, right? They tend to look for new ways to engage with their customers through a digital or data driven experience. Look at the number of mobile apps coming out of consumer, you know, really a B two C kind of businesses, right? So there's more and more digital focus, there's more and more data focus, and there's business decisions made around that data. So, I want to push you guys on this a little bit, because we've always used data in business. So that's not new. There's always been increasing amounts of data that are being used. So, while the volumes are certainly new, it's very interesting, it's by itself not that new. What is, what is new about this? What is really new about it that's catalyzing this change right now? Have you got some insights into that? Well, I mean, I would just say, if you look at some of the largest companies that are no longer here, right? So you've got Blockbuster, you've got Borders Books and Music, you've got Radio Shack. Um, look at what Amazon has done to the retail industry. Um, you look at what Uber is doing to the transportation industry. You look at every single industry, there's disruption and there's the success of, of this new innovative company. And I think that's why now. Yes, data's always been an important attribute of any kind of business operation as more data gets digital. Um, combine that with innovation and you know, APIs that allow you to sort of, and a public cloud to be able to use that as a launch pad for innovation, I think those are some of the things about why now. I mean, that would be my take, I don't know. Yeah, I think there's a couple things. I mean, number one, I think, yes, cust I mean, you know, businesses have been storing data for years and using data for years, but what you're seeing is new ways to use the data, right? There's, there's analytics now, mm -hmm. it is so easy to run analytics compared to what it was just years ago that you can now use data that you've been storing for years and run historical patterns on that and figure out trends and, and new ways to do business. Yep. I think the other piece that is very interesting is the machine learning, the artificial intelligence, right? So much of the industry now, I mean, look at the, uh, you know, look at the automotive industry, right? They are, they are collecting more information than I bet they ever thought they would because the autonomous driving yep. effort, all of that is all about collecting information, doing analytics on information and creating AI capabilities within their products, right? So there's a whole new, business, there's all new, there's a whole new revenue streams that are coming up as a result of leveraging insights from data. So let me run something by you, because I, I was looking for something different. <laughs> it used to be that the data that we were working was what I call stylized data. You can't go out here in Berlin and wander the streets and find accounting. It doesn't exist. It's man, it's human made, it's contrived. HR is contrived. We have historically built these systems based on transactions with highly stylized types of data. There's only so much you could do with it. But because of technology, mobile, IOT, others, we now are utilizing real world data. So we're collecting an entirely new class of data that has a dramatic impact in how we think about business and operations. Does that comport with what the study said? That the study, or, or the study respondents focusing on new types of data as opposed to just traditional sources of data? I mean, we certainly looked at, at correlations of what data thrivers are doing by different types of data. Um, I would say, you know, we, in terms of the, the new types of data that are emerging, you know, you've got time series data, stream data that's increasingly important. You've got machine generated data from sensors. Um, and I would say that one thing I would say this is this, that the thrivers do better than merely just survivors is have processes and procedures in place to action the data, right? Um, you know, to collect it and analyze it, as Brett pointed out, is, is accessible. 
and it's easy. But what's not easy is to action results and, and you know out of that data to drive change in business processes, to drive change in um, you know how things are, are are brought to market, for example. So I would say those are things that data thrivers are doing that maybe data survivors aren't. Um, I don't know if you'd have anything to add to that. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. I, I think, you know, yes, traditional data, I mean, but it's interesting because even those traditional data sets that have been sitting there for years have untapped value. There's, Well, right? combined with other types of data. That's right. But we've also been doing data warehousing analytics right. for a long time. See, it's, it seems as though, I would guess, that the companies that are leading, many of the you mentioned, are capturing data differently. They're using analytics and turning data into value differently and then they are taking action based on that data differently. Yeah. And I'm wondering if across the continuum that you guys have identified of thrivers all the way down to survivors, and you mentioned one other, uh, data... Resistors. Uh, resistors, <laughs> and there was, anyway, so there's some continuum of data sure. companies. Do, do they fall into that pattern where I'm good at capturing data, I'm good at generating analytics, but I'm not good at taking action on it? Is that what a data resistor is? Uh, well, so a data resistor is the, the sort of one extreme, right? Companies that are, don't have well-aligned processes, where they're doing digital transformation on a very ad hoc basis, it's not repeatable, um, you know, they're, they're somewhat resistant to change, right? Um, they're, they're really not embracing kind of the, that, that there's disruption going on, that data can be a source of, of enablement to do the disrupting, not be disrupted. So they're kind of resisting those fundamental constructs, I would right. say. And they typically tend to be very siloed, right? They, their IT is a very siloed architecture where they're not looking for ways to take advantage of new opportunities across the data that they're generating or the data they're collecting. So right? that would be they're not as good at creating business value right. out right. of the data that yes. they have access to. Yes. That's right, that's right. Okay. And maybe yeah, you they gotta, don't even... I think the whole thing with a thriver is, is they are purposeful, right? right. They, they set a, a high level object, a business level objective that says we're going to leverage data and we're going to use digital to help drive our business forward. We are going to look to disrupt our own business before somebody disrupts it for us. Right. So, so how do you help those data resistors? What's your message to them, particularly if they may not even operate with the belief that data is this asset? I mean, as, you, as we sort of the whole premise of, of, of this of the study. But I think the data that comes out, like, you know, hey, data thrivers are you know, two times more likely to, you know, to, or drive two, two times more profitability to, you know, there's lots of right. great statistics that we've pulled out of this that say thrivers have a lot more going for them. There, there, there is something, there is a direct correlation that says if you, are, if you are taking a high business value of your data and high business value of a digital transformation that you are going to be more profitable, you're going to generate more revenue, and you're going to be more relevant in the next you know, 10, 20 years. And that's what we kind of want to use that to say, okay, where are you on this journey? Where would, how, you know, we, we're actually giving them tools to measure themselves, like they can assess, they can take an assessment of their own situation and say, okay, we are a survivor. Okay, how do we move closer to being a thriver? And that's where NetApp would love to come in, engage, and say, okay, let's, let us show you best practices. Let us show you tools and capabilities that we can bring to bear to your environment to help you go a little bit further down that journey or help you on a path that's going to lead you to a data thriver. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. I agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> what is the thing that keeps you up at night for the data resistor, though, in the sense of someone who is, is not does not have, not only not, maybe not even capturing and storing the data, but really has no strategy to, to take the, whatever insights the, act, the data might be giving them to, to, to create value? Mm, I don't know, that's a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what keeps you up at night, I don't well, know. Well, I think, you know, look, I, I think if I were looking at a data resistor, I think the, the stats are, the data's against them, right? I mean, right? If you look at a Fortune 500 company, in the 1950s, their average time of their average lifespan was something like 40 years. Yeah. And by the year 2020, the average lifespan of an S&P 500 company is going to be seven years, and that's because of disruption. Now, you know, historically that may have been industrial disruption, and that, but now it's digital disruption, right? right? And that's that right there is ought to, you know, if you're kind of feeling like you're just a survivor, that ought to keep a survivor up at night. Right. right? 
But I can give you an answer too. Um, it's, for example, it's one of the reasons why so many executives today think they have to hire new millennials. It's because there's this presumption that millennials have a more natural affinity with data than older people like the me. The digital natives. Now, there's yes. not necessarily a lot of stats that definitely prove that, but mm -hmm. I think that's one of the kind of the misperceptions or one of the perceptions right. that I have to get more young people in because they'll be more likely to help me move forward with a, an empirical style of management than some older people who are used to, a, to have a very, very different type of management practice. Yeah. But still, there are a lot of things that companies, I would presume, would need to be able to do to move from one who is resisting these kinds mm -hmm. of changes to actually taking advantage of it. So can I ask one more question? Is it, is it that, you're dis did, the, did the research discover that data is the cause of some of these, or just it is just correlated with success? In other words, you take a company like Amazon, who did not have to build stores like traditional retailers, didn't have to carry that financial burden, didn't have to worry as much about those things. Now that may be starting to change, interestingly enough. Is that, so they found a way to use data to alter that business, but they also didn't have to deal with the financial structure of a lot of the companies that they were compet competing with. They were able to say our business is data, whereas others have said our business is serving the customer with these places in place. So which is it? Do you think it's a combination of cause and effect, or is it just that it's correlated? Hmm. I would say it's probably both, right? I mean, we do see a correlation, but I would say, you know, the study included companies whose business was data, uh, as well as companies that were across a variety of industries where they're just leveraging data in new ways. Um, I, you know, I would say there's a, probably some aspects of both of that, um, um, but that wasn't like a central tenant of the study per se. Um, but maybe that'll be phase two. <laughs> maybe we'll mine the data and try and you know find some insights there. Yeah, there's a lot more information that we can that we can glean from this data. I mean, there's that we think this will be an ongoing effort for us to kind of you know be a thought leader in this area. I mean, the data proved that there was 11 percent of our, of of those 800 respondents that are thrivers, which means most people are not in that, in that place yet. So, so I think it's going to be a journey for everyone. And I, yes, I agree that some companies may have some laws of physics or some previous disruptions, you know, like you know, brick and mortar versus, you know, versus online retail. But it doesn't mean there's not ways that traditional companies can't use right. technology. I mean, you, right. you look at, you, you, in the white paper, yeah. we use examples like General Electric right. and John Deere. These are right. very traditional companies that are using technology to collect data to, right. to provide insights right. into how their customers are using their products. Right. So that, that's kind of the thought leadership right. that any company has to have, right. is how do I leverage digital capabilities, online capabilities to my advantage, right. you know, and, and keep being disruptive in the digital age. Right. I, I think that's the that's right. kind of the message that, that right. we want them to hear. And, and I would just add to that, it's not only their data, but it's third party data, right? So it's enriching their data, say in the case of Starbucks. So Starbucks is a company that certainly has many physical assets, right? Um, you know, they're taking their customer data, they're taking partner data, whether that be, um, you know, music data or content from the New York Times, and they're combining that all to provide a customer experience on their mobile app that gives them, you know, a, a, an experience that on the digital platform that you, they might have experienced in the physical store, right? So when they go to order their coffee in their mobile pay app, you know, they don't have to wait in line, right, for their coffee. It's already paid for and ready when they go to pick it up. But while they're in their app, they can listen to music or they can read the New York Times. So there's a company that's using their own data plus third party data to really provide a more enriched experience for their company and that's a traditional physical company. And they're learning about their customers right. Right. Exactly. through that right. process exactly. too. Right. Are there any industries that you think are struggling more with this than others? Or, or is it really a company specific thing? Well, I mean the research shows that companies in every industry you know, are faced disruption and the research shows that companies in every industry, you know, are reacting, you know, to, to the, that disruption. Um, you know, there are some industries that tend to have, you know, obviously by industry, they, they might have more thrivers or more resistors. Um, uh, 
but you know, nothing I can per se call out, um, you know, by industry. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I think retail is the one that you can point to and say, there's one, there's an industry that's really struggling to really keep up with the disruption that the large, you know, that people like Amazon and others have handed, have really leveraged digital well in advance of them, well in advance of, of their thought process. So, you know, I think the, the, the white paper actually breaks down the data by industry, so you can kind of look at that. Yeah. Um, I think that will provide some details, but the, I think every, there is no industry immune. Right. So we'll just put it that way. Right. And the whole right. concept of industry is undergoing change That's true, as well. that is true. Yeah. It's, everything's being yeah. disrupted. Great. Yeah. Well, Brad and Laura, thank you so much for coming yeah. on the show. Thank it's you. been a great conversation. Yeah. Thank Enjoyed you. Enjoyed our time. Yeah. You're watching theCUBE. We will have more from NetApp Insight after this.